What comes through in, in Stoic writings to me, they recognized that an attack on your reputation hurts much more than an attack on your body. What people think of you is the most important thing, or at least that's the way we're wired to feel. You know, social media just, it pulls us in the wrong direction. If you think about spiritual progress, so much of social media pulls us in the wrong direction. So you said that the Stoics would have predicted social media, or they, they warned us about mm -hmm. it. To tell me about that. Well, so, um, so I guess I'll go back to 2017 when I was, I was really anxious um, about a, a lot of things. And, and, I started, and I sort of started rereading Stoicism. And at the same time, I was working on this book, The Calling the American Mind. And so like half my mind was like, you know, the world's going to blow up. We're going to have war with North Korea. And, you yeah. know, Donald Trump is going to be unstable. And, and my wife is going to Korea with my son. And like, no, you know, so it's yeah. like, and that was a period in which I, I decided to start reading, reading Stoicism, which I'd encountered long ago, but I kind of, re and then at the same time, while writing The Coddling the American Mind, which was all about what is happening to Gen Z, what's happening yeah. to young people. You know, you know the, all the, the mental illness, the depression, the anxiety, all the strange politics, um, and so on. One side, I was like writing down quotes from Aurelius, like for me. Yeah. But then it'd be like, you know, he'd say, you know, why do you always care about so much what other people think of you? And it's like, oh my God, it's like he knows what it's like to be on Twitter. Yeah. So I so I just started keeping this document, and then before I knew it, like by the time I was done with with the the coddling. You know, the calling's about three big ideas, three terrible, terrible ideas, and each the one... The great untruths. The great untruths, right, yeah. three great untruths. And each one, you find the exact opposite in Aurelius. I mean, in all, yes. all the Stokes, but Aurelius is, is the most clear. Yeah, it's weird. Obviously, they didn't have social media, but the things that drive social media, sort of extreme emotions, what the Stokes would call the passions, you know, the way the, the crowd or the mob gets whipped up into yeah. things, our propensity for gossip, our yeah. endless uh, appetite for distraction, all of those sort of driving uh, currents of social media obviously go fundamentally mm -hmm. to the human condition mm -hmm. in society. And so, yeah, they're talking about all those things and they had their own sort of uh, struggles with those mm -hmm. forces and right. their own solutions. To them. That's right. And that points us to what social media is doing to us because, you know, we there are quotes from, uh, what's his name, the first president of Facebook, um, whatever. Um, oh, Sean Parker? Yes, from yes, Sean Parker. About how, you know, we um, we basically hacked social psychology is what yeah. he's saying. You know, we we knew, you know, how it works and, and, and how to trigger some anxiety in people. And, and so it's like, you know, they understood people's insecurities and fears, and then they built something that preys upon it. Yeah. And it's bad enough for us as adults. I mean, you know, if, if the emperor of the Roman Empire... <laughs> has to take, coach himself to not, you know, yeah. don't you know, ignore the clacking of tongues, you know, yes. ignore the, you know, imagine what it's like for a 12 year old girl. Yeah. I mean, you think about how unnatural it is to be like uh, known to 50 million people the way that the emperor of Rome yeah. was. Mm -hmm. Right. And to have news from these far flung provinces, to have endless amounts of correspondence, to have all this stress, to feel like the weight of the world is on your yeah. shoulders. Like you, it, when you it, read meditations, you're like, this it's not good for a person yeah. to be in this position. Yeah. And then you're like, well, at least it's only one dude, right? Like only one mm -hmm. person is being subjected to this. But social media, uh, uh, I would argue, gives all of us the stress and information overload mm -hmm. that, you know, was previously limited to heads of state or the most famous individuals yeah. mm -hmm. ever, you know? And yeah. and for not that much upside, and certainly yeah. for most of us, not much in the way of compensation either. No, that's right. Well, that's right. And that gets, so then you say, well, so why do we do it? Yeah. <clears throat> and that's, you know, one of the, the main insights I'm hoping to get across in, in the new book is we're, we're all in a series of traps. We're all in a series of collective action traps. Mm -hmm. And the main reason, you know, I talk to my students, well, if it's doing this to you, you know, if you're spending six hours a day, you know, one student was spending n nine hours a day on TikTok, yeah. nine hours a day. I mean, she's completely sure. addicted. You know, and I asked them, why don't, you know, why don't you quit? And the answer is always the same. I can't because everyone else is on it. Right. And, you know, and what, and what comes through in, in Stoic writings to me is these are, these are men who were physically tough, very disciplined, but they recognized that an attack on your reputation 
hurts, like yes. much more than an attack on your body. That that what people think of you is the most important thing, or at least that's the way we're sure. we wired to feel, you know. And so they're you know they're they're working you know working on that. Um, so uh, yeah, so you know, social media just it it pulls us in the wrong direction. If you think about spiritual progress, so much of social media pulls us in the wrong direction. Yeah, I think one of the most fascinating quotes in meditations, Mark Sura says, you know, you you obviously love yourself more than other people, right? Mm-hmm. We're all sort of selfish, and he goes, but for some reason. You care about other people's opinions more than your own, meaning like you know who you are, you right. know what you stand for, mm-hmm. you know what's good about you. And then some random stranger yeah. says you're ugly or stupid or the book that you just spent two mm-hmm. years of your life working yeah. on is, is trash. Mm-hmm. And you go, is it trash? Am mm-hmm. I trash? And, and in an instant, all of your sense of self gets replaced by mm-hmm. what some random stranger said. And, and that this is, I think, yeah, this is a timeless battle that really yeah. strong people, really smart people, yeah. really well insulated people, you know, mm-hmm. really well educated. Everyone has has struggled with this for a really mm-hmm. long time. And yet, it, if they're struggling with it, you're struggling with it. And then also your teenage children That's are right. definitely struggling yeah. with it. That's right. And kids need to, the kids need adversity. That's one of the big themes of, of a lot of my work. Kids are anti-fragile. All of us are anti-fragile. We we get stronger from adversity. And boy, are there quotes from the Stoics on yeah. that. I mean, they like every ancient tradition, they knew that. Um, but kids need them on a small scale. Yeah. And they need they need to make mistakes in a, an environment that's low stakes. Yeah. Where you say something stupid, people laugh at you, they make fun of you, you're embarrassed, and then you know an hour later, recess is over and it's yeah. over. Um, uh, and, and you know, so you know, kids and kids are going to gossip. They need to practice all those skills. But it's like we take them. You know, it's, it's like instead of playing, you know, play war, which kids have always done. It's like here, here are some real guns. <laughs> yes. Why don't you go shoot each other? Like, no, yeah, it's, this is it's just, too much. Way, it's too much. They're too young. I mean, I, I think about that. I, I obviously know all this stuff. I'm, I'm pre- I have a pretty, uh, you know, uh, thick skin. Um, I uh, know what's important. I know what I stand for. But I know if I subject myself to mm-hmm. endless amounts of unsolicited criticism mm-hmm. or feedback, positive or negative, it skews me. And, yeah. and there's there's a great passage in, in uh, Epictetus, I think. It might have been Seneca. But basically he's saying, like, look, a Stoic should be able to endure any environment, mm-hmm. right? Like yeah. uh, be the, the yeah. mob jeering at you, you know, everyone cheering for you, mm-hmm. uh, adversity, stress, noise, whatever. But he was like, if you have a choice, you should choose peace, yeah. right? And mm-hmm. and it, what he's saying is that, yeah, look, uh, sometimes information is gonna get to you, and you're gonna have to figure out how to not let that rattle you, not let it get inside your head. But that's very different than waking up every morning and mainlining this mm-hmm. information, right. or or making it your primary form of interacting mm-hmm. with other people yeah. or society. And and so yeah, that choice. I, I hope people understand. It's not like weak like oh you can't cut mm-hmm. it or right. you're too sensitive <clears throat> but in fact all of us are too sensitive and right. so we should limit our mm-hmm. exposure to very powerful sources. when you go and get an x-ray they throw that lead vest on you so, because yeah. it's mm-hmm. not good to get yeah. unnecessary amounts of radiation yeah. there's there's another reason why another thing we should talk about which which relates to stoic insights it's not just that it does things to you um it's it's that uh, there's a great quote from from Aurelius. But it's basically, you know, well, the Buddhist quote is, you know, we are what we think, all that we are arises yes. out of our thoughts. And, and what's the quote from Aurelius? The very soul much... is died by the color of your thoughts. Thank you. That's it. The soul is died by the color of your thoughts. And so now think, so, you know, I teach, I te- I'm a professor at NYU at Stern, and I teach a course called Flourishing. Yeah. Uh, and it's a sort of positive psychology course. And I work with the students um, to become make them uh, smarter, stronger, and more sociable. And the stronger piece is emotionally stronger. The stronger, the stronger piece is Stoicism, uh, especially the wonderful book, The Stoic Challenge by yeah. William Irvine. Uh-huh. Everyone loves that book. Um, and in the last year or two, I've really been working with them a lot more on their relationship to their phones and social media, because yeah. that dominates their lives. And one thing that I learned that was really surprising or uh, alarming um, is so I work with them a lot on their morning routine and their evening routine. Yes. And again, this is you know very much this is sort of why I started reading Stoicism in the morning was like, okay, you should do it every day and set aside time. And um, and so I, I made up a little form like, okay, what are the first five things when you open your eyes? What's the very first thing you do? Do you go to the bathroom? Do you drink? Wait, what's the very first thing you do? And you, what are the first five things? Let's get control of those. Yeah. And start your day right. 
And at the end of the day, count down. You know, you brush your teeth. Like, what are the, what are the very last things you do? Count down to zero and you close your eyes. And for the great majority, number one in the morning was check my texts and incoming yeah. DMs, things like that. And at night, number one on the countdown, the last thing before you close your eyes is yeah. checking your texts and yes. your DMs, et cetera. And in between those two, what are they doing? A Lots lot of it is of the same. Yeah. So, you know, if, if your soul is dyed by the color of your thoughts, this is really sad. Yeah, you are what you eat. You That's are right. what you, the information you are. diet that you exactly. consume. That's right. So this is, I think, one of the really important lessons for the social media age is we all have to take control of our inputs because yeah. we're all suffering from this. You know, our, you know, we're adults. This hit us. I mean, you're much younger than me. I don't know. When did you, get, when did you first get any kind of social media? What age? Um, I had to wait until I graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as soon as I got my college email address, I could join Facebook. So oh, I, you were the right. last, yeah. sort of the last part of that. So you were a young millennial. Sister, what, year, what year were you born? Uh, 87. My sister, who's just okay. a tad younger than me, had it through all of high school, right? So just that mm -hmm. slight difference yeah. Um, yeah. is, uh, yeah. Right. So, but also the, the Facebook that you had wasn't nearly as no, toxic. It was a real network of real people. Exactly. Because yeah. we used to, they used to be called social networking systems. They connected yeah. people. Yeah. And it was really in 2009 that it, it, they get the like button, the retweet button, it gets super the viral. News feed. The news feed. Exactly. Yeah. You put the news feed together with the like and the retweet or share buttons. Um, and then you have so much information coming into Facebook that they can now use algorithms. Yeah. So, Everything reconfigures in 2009. It yeah. gets really nasty. Um, and it's it's the kids who started puberty then, yeah. around 2010. They're the ones who really were, their, 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 their souls were dyed yes. by this toxic sludge coming in. Well, the, the morning and the evening routine are really important because you realize how vulnerable you are. Like the, the way I think about it is every morning you wake up, it's a fresh start, right? Yeah, it's a, yeah. you, you, you just slept. Uh, you haven't, you've had no inputs coming at you, right? Mm -hmm. You're, you're who are you going to be? What are you going to do that mm -hmm. day? Uh, is it a good day, a bad day? You haven't even looked outside. You don't even know what the weather is, right? It's all, yeah. it's all, it's all before you potentially. Mm -hmm. And the choices you make have the ability to make the most of that or mm -hmm. uh, to not take advantage of it, right? And, and so, you know, if you wake up, like I, I found this with myself, it's like I wake up, I'm in a good mood, even if I'm tired, I'm like, what am I gonna do today? Today's a good mm -hmm. day. And then I'm saying, well, let's hope that what is currently in my inbox continues to allow me to have mm -hmm. a good day or not. Yeah. Or let's see what insert politician tweeted while right. I was sleeping. Let's see what news happened mm -hmm. in uh, a third world wait, country. Wait, so you do that? As soon as you wake up, you check your phone? No, no, what I'm saying is I found that I'm waking up, oh, you're checking you your okay. phone. What, mm -hmm. what I was doing is saying, I'm gonna let the world determine whether today yeah. is a good day yep. or a bad day, <clears throat> or not even that, whether this morning is like, I'm currently happy, mm -hmm. and then I'm mm -hmm. checking my phone to see, yeah. will this continue or not, right? right? Like, right. And so, a bubble maybe sounds like not something a stoic would do, but it is. I'm trying to keep a bubble in the morning while I'm fresh, mm -hmm. while I don't have any responsibilities or obligations yet, and I want to enjoy that. So right. my rule is like, I don't, I don't touch my phone for the first one hour that I'm mm -hmm. awake, um, and then uh, I don't do any social media stuff on my phone either. So, yeah, right, so that's extended right. also. Yeah. And then I'm spending time with my family. I'm reading. We're going outside. We're going for. We're mm -hmm. doing. So, so now you know. Let's say I am. Uh, you know, I'm checking my phone on the way into work or, you know, I'm getting a phone call on the way to the office or whatever. You know, now I've been up for a couple mm -hmm. hours. I've right. got my legs under me. I, you know, I've already enjoyed a good mm -hmm. chunk of the day. The, the problem is you wake up and you're just, you're just saying, you're just kind of spinning the, yep. the wheel. Back and, and into you're, the maelstrom. Yeah. yeah and, and that's just yeah. not... Yeah. You you would have to be a true stoic sage or a monk to not be affected by that stuff. And so you have to create some space right. where it's not the first thing that you're right. doing. A friend of mine said, you know, I check my email just to see if there's any fires that I have to put out. Uh -oh. And it's like, yeah, I no. bet you always find them, right? Yeah, of course, right. you you that's went right. looking for them. Right. If you go Are looking for any, trouble, yeah. you're going to find Are it. Are there any that have to be put out at 6.45 as opposed to 9.30? Certainly not. And definitely if you're 19 years old. Yeah, you, right. you know what I mean. Like, right. if you're the CEO of a oh, multinational yeah. corporation or you you trade stocks, yeah. oh, you know, yeah. for okay. for yeah. for that's wealthy investors, it. it's different. Yeah, but true. like the younger you are, definitely yeah. protect yeah, that right. space. That's right. So, Ryan, what is your evening routine? How do you 
you know, w once you sort of stop working or doing goal directed stuff, what do you do? Yeah, my 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 evening routine is I would say less good than my morning routine, mm -hmm. but uh, a couple big principles I have. I try to journal before bed, mm -hmm. so I'm doing putting the day just up free for form? review. You just have a notebook, or do you have a structured? So I, I I have a couple different journals that I use. Um, one one is just a blank journal where I'm just mm -hmm. sort of writing stuff down. I have one that I love. It's called One Line a Day, and you just oh. write one sentence each huh. day. And what I love about that is it's it has five lines on each page okay so i can see where i was five huh, years uh -huh. earlier so almost always i'm going to my wife hey did you know like oh, two years oh, ago i was right here oh, wow. yeah and and how like it'll always be like i was starting chapter wow. one of yeah. like the book that i was writing uh -huh. three years ago and and the full circle you realize for all the changes things stay the same mm, and yeah. and or, or you you go i totally forgot like February 27th mm. of, you know, 2020 was the worst day of yeah. my, like, was horrible. And I've mm. totally forgotten about yeah, it, right? So yeah. I do that one. And then uh, I have a journal for Daily Stoic, which has like a Stoic question every right. day. Mm. And you're supposed to meditate on the morning and meditate in the evening. So I do that. So I do a little journaling. My other thing is um, I sleep with the phone in the other room. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, so it's not the last thing that right. I touch. Mm -hmm. And also by having that space in the morning where I say I don't touch the phone for an hour, that means seven, eight, nine hours minimum of uninterrupted right. blocks of not yeah. doing it, right? Yeah. Um, so, so that's a big one. And then, you know, I, I try to read in the evenings before bed. That's, mm -hmm. that's a, a big part of it. Um, but, but once my kids go to bed, it's sort of like, yeah, I think my wife like, and I's discipline collapses and we're just yeah. like well, you're still right staggering around. No, you're still in the age where it's it's a, a full time yeah. job. Yeah. But but yeah, I, I think when people talk about their morning routines, mm -hmm. I think too often it seems like this feat <clears throat> of raw human discipline mm -hmm. when really the seeds of that success are sowed the night before. Yeah. And if you right. stayed up till three in the morning scrolling Instagram yeah. reels. It's hard to get up early. It's yeah. hard not to, you know, That's so right. I, I try to make some good decisions at the end of the day good. to set mm -hmm. me up for success then the next right. day. No, that, that, right. That's that's a good point about it. it starts the night before. So what I, what I do with my students is rather than saying, how do you start your day? How do you end your day? I say, you have about, you know, an eight to 11 hour block of time yeah. that is to recharge. And the core of that is your sleep. Yeah. But, you know, think about the hour or two before, the hour or two after. So, so let's start with the night before, yeah. you know, and let's make sure we get that period. Um, and, you know, some of them get enough sleep, but many of them don't. And so it's like this period that should be recharging. It's like not enough sleep and a lot of electronic stimulation yeah. at night with blue light and poor sleep and then, uh, you know, rush in the morning. Yes. And so, yeah, of course, this takes a toll on mental health. Yeah, of course. You're just running yourself ragged. Yeah. I mean, you're burning the candle at, at both ends and then, yeah. yeah, you're just not you're not good. Yeah, I. The ability to concentrate, put large, uninterrupted blocks of concentrate. That's a muscle that you have to to develop, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that's something the Stoics talk a lot about too, and that social media is sort of the enemy of yeah. the ability to concentrate, to stay locked into <clears throat> what you're doing. Um, Marx really is. Um, Thanks his philosophy teacher Rusticus. He says, mm -hmm. you know, he taught me to not be satisfied just getting the gist of things, mm -hmm. and so it had that deep, like yeah. locked in understanding yeah. of something that takes work and it takes tuning out yeah. those easier forms of attention or stimulation. Mm -hmm. That's right. I'm a big fan of Cal Newport. Yeah, of course. And He's he has, coming in he here has, next week. Oh, good. That's yeah. right. He has, a, he has a book coming. I can't wait to read that. Um, but we read in my in my flourishing class at NYU. We we read his book Deep Work. Yeah. Amazing book. Um, and so what I work with my students on is, it's, you know, yes, it's a muscle, but, you know, as a social psychologist, I'm always interested in what are all the external things hitting you? Yeah. And so the, the main thing that really interrupts them is that they're, they're mostly getting, you know, two, three, four hundred notifications a day. Yeah. You know, texts, group texts, notifications from all these apps. And so uh, one of the most powerful exercises or things that I do with, with the students is um, on the second or third day of class, I say, okay, take out your phone. Like we have, a, you know, I have a no phone policy and all my, you know, no screen policy, not even computers because it's all so distracting. Um, so take out your phone, go to screen time, go to, you know, notifications, how many notifications. Uh, now look at the list of apps that you've, that, and what are the settings? 
and you know you, you have 100, 200 apps, all of which have permission to notify yes, you. Yes, yes, yes. And I try to get them to see, look, your attention is the most valuable resource. You can get an infinite amount of money. Like yeah. money is valuable, but you can, you know, there, there's no limit on how much money you can make. No matter how rich you are, there's a limit on how much attention you have. Yes. And if you're giving it away to any company that wants to take it from you, you get ten percent off like a, a, an online clothing retailer's yeah, uh, you know, that's right. fall collection. It's, that's right. You just maybe, but you just gave up five dollars worth of attention. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so what I tell them is, okay, look at the list, pick five to keep on. Yeah. Turn everything else off. Yeah. So, like you know, Uber or Lyft, you're going to keep that on, of yeah. course. But things like that, like and you know, texting, we talk a lot about because that's you know, you, you kind of most almost everyone you need to keep that on, but it's becoming a nightmare because yeah. everyone's texting everyone all the time. You're in too many group chats. That's, that's right. Your problem. Yeah. That's right. But when the students turn off their notifications, especially for news sources, like do not get yes. updates. Do not get important updates from the news. Yes. Like yes. if there's a nuclear bomb, you know, nuclear missile coming towards us, someone will tell you. <laughs> okay. But you know. Again, um, you're not trading stocks. You yeah, know what I mean? Right. You're not trading stocks yeah. in real time. You do not need, like, you ask not yourself, when was the last time you acted on any of this information? Mm -hmm. yeah. And how, right. how often it was disproven or made irrelevant yeah, by almost right. the Five minutes subsequent later. updates. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So doing that, when they turn off the notifications, they get amazing results. They say, like, I can do my homework. Like, yeah. I can sit at my desk and work for 30 minutes because yes. I'm not constantly fragmenting yes. my attention. Yeah, it, it's a paradoxical thing when you meet really, really successful, important, talented, great people like, uh, you know, and some artist you really admire, or a billionaire or, you know, a, a high up elected uh, leader or a general or, you know, you meet someone who's like just doing a lot, right? You're like thousands, yeah. tens of thousands of people report to this person mm -hmm. or this person moves markets by themselves or, you know, uh, you know, uh, this person makes decisions of international consequence. You would think no one would be busier than that person. Mm -hmm. No one would be more frantic, frenzied than that person. But it's actually the opposite. Like their phone's nowhere to be seen. Mm -hmm. It's certainly not face up going off yeah. all the time. There, yeah. There's actually well, they, a Well, they have a person. They must have a person who handles all that. But, that, but my point is that successful, uh, important people mm -hmm. understand that the most valuable thing they can have is space and yeah. time to think to be uh, considerate, to mm -hmm. not be emotional or irrational. They have to protect their main asset, which is their yeah. brain, their ability to make decisions. Because yeah. that's what they're doing all day is making decisions. Yeah. And if they're overstimulated, if they're, uh, if they're tapped out, if they're jerked in too many directions, mm -hmm. if inconsequential things are making their way, they're not yeah. going to be able to do that. And so um, they're busier than you, but they've created more space and room mm -hmm. and protected themselves yeah. more than you. Yeah. And you, I think you want to do your best to emulate that in your in your own mm -hmm. life. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's they do have people, um, but they've also decided, they've also made some decisions about what is and isn't important to them. And a lot of what they delegate to a person, you know, their chief of staff or their assistant or whatever, you can also do through automation. You can do oh, through, yeah. you know what? Like, yeah, I need to do a lot more of that. Yeah, and, and so yeah. I just, it's it's important that you, you understand that actually, like the people that you admire, who are busier than you, mm -hmm. are less frenzied, yeah. less. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not getting zapped all the time. That's right. And and well, they're, that's they're what we do to ourselves. Right, they take in charge of their inputs and their yeah. attention, and they're using it to to good effect. So so let's talk about kids because you yeah. have yours are four and seven. I yes. Think. Yes. Um, so. Um, what you know? What are you planning on doing in terms of electronic environment, phones, I, you know, tablets, video games? It's because you have sorry, you have a boy, seven? two boys, two boys, two okay, boys. Seven. And and it's interesting with my seven year old because my seven year old is a, well, they're both pandemic kids, but my seven year old, you know, was going to school and then wasn't going to school, um, yeah. and we can see, uh, and obviously we're working on, it, but we can see the way in which the iPad became for a period of time, yeah. not just an escape, but also like a security blanket, the world felt mm -hmm. crazy. His parents were stressed. The world was stressed. Mm -hmm. Things were, and that was a that was a, a thing, right? And so we can tell that it means something to mm -hmm. him that we're trying to slowly sort of wean him him off. Um, but it, but you know we um, we've been. I, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who has young kids the same age, and he was like, "We've just started." He's like, "We watch." a DVD on our big TV, yeah. you know, like yeah. over and over, because he's like, mm -hmm. there's something about 
the infinite of choices available that's exhausting. You know, mm -hmm. like I watch my son, he yeah. pulls up you know, his iPad, he has his little YouTube kids, which doesn't have everything on the internet, mm -hmm. just like mm -hmm. stuff that's safe. <clears throat> but it's like he's clicking the thing and then he'll wait like 30 seconds and he clicks another yeah, thing. That's right. and, and, and I just think about the way that in my own childhood, my choices were so circumscribed. Mm -hmm. There was so many television stations, right. so many radio stations. That's right. I had to just, I, and, and as a result, I discovered things. Mm -hmm. I, I was forced to endure things. Mm -hmm. And so we were kind yeah. of trying to circumscribe, one of the things we're working on, not instead of just going, you can't use a screen. We're right. just thinking, how do you circumscribe choice? Right. Because okay. it's exhausting. Yeah. We, we know so choice, that choice is yeah. exhausting. The choice is a part of it, but I'd like to also point out, there's a big difference between TV and a touch screen. Yes. And there's a lot of differences. Uh, one of them is that the touch screen is a small screen that you watch individually, whereas yes. the TV is a large screen that you often watch with your siblings, you can watch yep. with your parents. It's, um, another is that on TV, the shows tend to be long, like at least 25 minutes, and movies are longer. Whereas when you go uh, nowadays, especially, the main thing that they're doing is TikTok, YouTube shorts, Instagram mm -hmm. reels. Um, the short ones are, you know, for, for everybody with kids here listening, it's the short videos Breaks your brain. That, that break your brain. That's yeah. right. Because the long form videos are a story. They make some sense. You don't do anything. You watch. Uh, whereas the short form is like is like a dog trainer training a dog. It's you know you give you give them little tiny treats a lot, and you can shape any behavior you want. Yeah. And um, when I when I asked my students, I did a, a little thing with them at the end of the semester last year. I said. Okay, how many of you watch watch Netflix? Yeah. Okay, everybody. How many of you wish that Netflix was never invented? Okay, nobody. Yeah. Okay. How many of you watch TikTok? The great majority. Yeah. How many of you wish it was never invented? Almost all of them. Because it's it's addiction, yes. it's a it's a trap. Well, um, I think about this too, it's like it's not always true, but you know, the average production costs of a Netflix show or a TV show mm -hmm. is in the tens of millions of dollars, oh, right? Oh, yeah, so pe so right. someone had to really be thoughtful about what they were making, That's right? That's a good point. And, like, you think, or even cheap stuff like uh, Mr. Rogers or Sesame Street. You think about all the time and energy yeah. that went into every frame. Right. Uh, you know, there's child development experts that are on yeah. there. Mr. Rogers is a thoughtful guy. And then you contrast this with the family that's uploading 20 YouTube videos a week mm -hmm. of their kid unboxing toys right, or, right. you know, doing stuff. I'm not saying they don't mean well, but their range of communication mm -hmm. and the <clears throat> the uh, the knowledge behind what they're communicating yeah. is just so much less. And so well, there, right. there is a big right. difference. And actually, we might even be able to say that they don't mean well because, you know, Mr. Rogers or anybody, anybody who's trying to make something, they're trying to make something great. Yeah. Uh, now, OK, there's reality TV. You know, there's some. Sure. Obviously, trash on TV, but but people were working together to create something good, uh, and they are you know, and there are awards for the best shows. It's the difference between like a tweet and a book, you yeah, know, like right. someone that's someone right. spent years yeah. crafting this book, and it's been through editors yeah. and publishers and all these things, and then the tweet is like one of thirty things that person that's right. said. That's right. But why are parents putting up these videos? I mean, I would you know, I would never would never do that. There was just this big article in the New York Times recently about. These, you know, moms who, who, whose daughters, you know, five, six, seven years old, they're putting up all kinds of videos. They want them to be help have a modeling career. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, hundreds of perverts are contacting them and their daughters. Uh -huh. I mean, it's insane that, that people do this. Um, I'm not sure that the, that the mothers there mean well. Now, I don't blame them. What I'm saying is I, I think they're caught up in the race for prestige that you know, this, the, you know, the, the, the Madden, it's, there's a quote from the Tao, like race, you know, precious things lead, you know, lead the mind astray. Uh, oh, I forget the whole quote, but the point is yeah. they're, you know, they're, they're not doing this for their daughters. Yes. They're doing it for the prestige and then the daughters are collateral damage. Well, there's another part of it is like when you watch some show on television and there's a child in there. There's uh, a whole bunch of laws that protect mm. that child oh, right, right. and the earnings that yeah. that child is getting, right? That's not, yeah. And that's not true for this media. random YouTube channel. And there yeah. is something fundamentally exploitative about it mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. fundamentally unregulated as a result of the yeah. sort of wild westness of it. And and you, like a, a friend of mine who's a big YouTuber, he's like, if you have a kid you know how hard it is to get them to do things. Yeah. And so you watch these videos and you go, 
what's on the cutting room floor? And there's this mm -hmm. horribly haunting video of this mom in the car. Oh, yes, I saw that. And, oh, and that was she's disgusting. Like, she's like, I need you yeah. to make a sad face. Their dog, they just yeah. put down their dog. Yeah. And, and she goes, I need you to look really sad. And he goes, I am sad. I'm crying. Yeah. You know, and she's, she's making, uh, she's yeah. seeing her kid as a prop yes. in this, what the irony is she wasn't even like a professional yeah. like successful youtuber yeah. do you know what i mean it's not she like she's the kardashians yeah. she's like a, a nobody That's and right. and here she is taking one of the worst moments of her yeah. child's life and seeing it through the yeah. lens of will this work as a thumbnail or not that's right that's right and there you go and it's like an adaptation of the aurelius quote we had yeah. before you know it's like you care about your child but then why do you actually care more about what people will think of your moment together and you're yes. ignoring your child? Yes. So, yeah, just in so many ways, the move, you know, I mean, of course, when television came in, you know, everyone thought it was the dumbing down of yeah. America. And there were, there now were we look back and go, Mr. Rogers the, is the yeah, greatest the thing ever. Yeah. That's right. That's right. But, you know, what I'm trying to get across, so, you know, in the anxious generation, what I'm trying to get across is that this is not just another moral panic over the new technology. Yes. They're always, you know, whenever there's a new technology, especially if the kids are using it, you know, radio, comic books, TV, anything. Yeah. Yes, there's going to be older people saying, look what it's doing, it's dumbing them down. So that's always there. But never before has there been a new technology that almost instantly caused a wave of depression, anxiety, self-harm, and suicide. Yeah. This, this started in 2012, basically as soon as the, as soon as, you know, 2012 is the big year that Instagram really comes out. Um, and as soon as the girls get on Instagram, that's, you know, I can't say it's all yeah. from Instagram, but the biggest single cause of the girls' mental health decline, I believe is social media. And, and there's plenty of evidence showing there's a correlation. There are a lot of experiments showing it as well. It's causal, it's not just a correlate. Um, but what I'm getting at is, the, the complete rewiring of social relations, information flow, news, dating, sexuality, yeah. everything now is going through the phones. And this is a transformation about as big as, you know, if God just like flipped a switch and said, you know, this 80-20 atmosphere they have on Earth, 20% oxygen, let's just flip it. Yeah. Let's just make it 80% oxygen, 20% nitrogen. Like, Where it's like everyone lives on farms it, and suddenly you all live in tenements in a city. Like it's yeah, a yeah. profound it's a reimagining of society. That's yeah. right. And this only happened really about 12 years ago. It really yeah. hit around 2012. In 2010, very few kids have an iPhone. They still have flip phones. In 2015, the great majority have an iPhone and a social media account. So yeah. that's it's 2010 to 2015 is what I'm calling the great rewiring of childhood. And... You know, we kind of notice it ourselves as adults, but our brains were actually already formed. Yeah. So our lives changed, but it didn't really change our brains. Yeah. Whereas kids who are starting puberty before 2010, you know, the late millennials, if you're born in 1993, 1984, you're the end of the millennial generation, you know, they didn't get, they didn't get in, thrown into the, you know, into this whirlpool until late high school or college. Yeah. Gen Z, I think, is defined by the fact that they're the first people, not you know, not to have the internet. The internet, what, the early internet was not harmful. They were the first to go through puberty in this new super viral, addictive social media world right. that really comes in around 2012. Yeah, one of the decisions we made is like, we don't ever show pictures of our kids on social media. Good, yes. And the reason we did that is obviously there's, privacy is a thing mm -hmm. and you know, AI and whatever. Yeah. But a big part was we didn't want to as we experienced things as a family, mm, to yeah, be thinking, yeah. how do how will I this look? Yeah, how do yeah. I publish this to yeah. other people? And I remember we were taking a, a family photo at the beach uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, you know we set up the thing, and, and then you hit it, and it's about like ten seconds. You have to do it right. And uh, my oldest would uh, he would wait for like six, seven, eight, and then he would lunge to the camera. He would try to oh, knock it over. That's the oh. game he was playing. And then his younger brother was doing the same. And there was this moment where both my wife and I were like, "You're ruining the picture." Mm -hmm. And then we right, were like, right. wait, "Wait, no, wait, no, this, this is, is the, the picture. picture. This yes, is this yes. is who you were at this yeah. moment." Right. There is. Yeah. And, and, you know, already, you know, for generations, parents have been like, we got to get something for the Christmas card. And that's yeah. a performative moment. But right. that's one that's thing one we do a year. year. Yes. Not this constant yeah. stream of performance mm -hmm. and right. this publication bias of I'm only showing yeah. when we're all matching in our clothes yeah. and everything's going well. We were at we were at Disneyland and we turned to these people behind us. 
and we're talking to the kids and we go like, what rides have you been? We were waiting, sort of a juxtaposition of technology. We were waiting in line for that little old timey shop on Main Street where they cut out your silhouette. We wanted oh, to get yeah. like oh, yeah. okay. hand cut silhouettes yeah. of our kids. And you know, it's like, I don't know, noon, one o'clock. And we're asking the family behind us like, oh, um, like what rides have you guys done? Mm-hmm. These are old, kids a little older than ours. And the, and the family's all wearing matching shirts mm-hmm. and, and they go, oh, we haven't we haven't done any rides yet. We've been posing for pictures all day. <gasps> yeah. And you realize, okay, oh, now you have replaced, kids. yeah, you yeah. have replaced experiencing in reality for performing yeah. in virtual exactly. reality. And, and it can, again, these aren't like professional content creators. This no, is just right. people it's who don't happening. understand it's... that Facebook and its algorithm or Instagram and its algorithm or mm-hmm. TikTok has, has consumed you and turned yeah. you into like an appendage of the thing mm-hmm. and you don't understand like you are performing free yeah. unpaid labor for this thing at the cost of a moment you'll never get back. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. There's a just talking with a British person who said, you know, there's a phrase they use in Britain, uh, don't put your daughter on the stage. Mm. And it's it's a line from an old Noel, Noel Coward song. But uh, the gist of it is if you grow up on the stage, terrible things happen to you especially if you're a girl. Like sure. Girls especially should not grow up, photograph, 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 look at me, look at me, I'm performing for you. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's bad for every kid. I mean, you know, Macaulay Culkin and yeah. others are the famous examples yes. of kids whose you know, fame spoils them. But it's just warping. It's warping human development. That's another theme in, in my book um, is, you know, there's all this research, and I'm in this debate with other researchers about, does social media cause depression and anxiety? That's a yeah. major question. You know, the answer is yes, but the, we debate over how big the effect is. But there's like 10 other avenues of harm. Yeah. And um, so you know, just to, to warp the developmental process, social development, political development, spiritual, everything gets warped. And so that's all right. We probably are probably boring our audience with our endless going on about social well, I media. Do, I want to talk about anxiety because one of the interesting passages in meditations, Mark Shreya says, you know, today, he says, today I escaped anxiety. And he says, no, oh, actually, I discarded yes, it. It's I within love that. me. Yes. So it's kind of this paradoxical thing where we're the cause of the anxiety, yeah. right? The yeah. Stokes would say the events are external. You can't blame the airport or other people or money. Mm-hmm. You can't blame other things for the anxiety. And yet, I, 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 I would agree with that, but I would also say you can – if you go looking for things, you'll get more anxiety. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the environment you put yourself in either flips that switch on in you or it, it doesn't. Well, you know, the environment certainly flips switches in us. That's why we have emotions. Yeah. Um, but, but there are big individual differences in emotional reactivity. And, you know, one of the big five traits is neuroticism. Some people just, they're more anxious. They see more problems. They make mountains out of molehills. Um, a, a, a concept that I find is very helpful for my students and in, in my books um, is the contrast between what's called um, discover mode versus defend mode. Mm. So the brain is set up so that there's a set of cer- a set of systems that are active in goal pursuit. And so, like, if you see, you know, a, a dog or a cat stalking something, like they're totally focused, they're energized, yeah. they're you know they're excited. It's so that's especially in the front left. It's called the behavioral activation system. But then if something suddenly there's like, you know, a big, you know, big boom or a person comes along or there's you know, some reason to fear, then circuits that are especially located the front right cortex activate very, very quickly. The alarm system is very, very quick. And then the brain flips over into a withdrawal, avoid, defend mode. And especially as an educator, as a college professor, you know, what I saw uh, and my friend Greg Lukianoff saw first is all of a sudden around 2014, a lot of the students were in defend mode. And we don't think of college students as being anxious and afraid and afraid of ideas and afraid of books. It doesn't make any sense. To get the most out of college or any, any education, you need to be in discover mode. Yeah. But something happened to kids born after 1996 and later. When they arrived in college, they were in defend mode. So to come back to what you were saying, yes, the environment definitely flips your switches. But I think the point of stoicism is you can decide how reactive you want to be. Now, at the extreme, you'd never react. And this is the ideal in Buddhism and Hinduism also. Be the same in success and failure. You know, don't be attached. Uh, So there's, you know, the Buddhist, actually, I will be able to talk about, like, you know, the Buddhist or Eastern version of Stoicism. But but my point is that um, if, if you keep in mind, either as a parent or a teacher or just a person going through life, 
you want to be in discover mode as much as possible. Yeah. We live in a world that's very, very safe, physically safe. Yeah. Um, you want to be in discover mode as much as possible, and I think stoicism is a is a is a, a technique for getting into discover mode and staying there even when things happen in the world. And this is exactly the opposite of what a lot of students are learning yeah. from therapy and from a therapeutic culture, which is the world is full of triggers. Yeah. Oh my goodness, we have to get rid of the triggers. Yeah. You know, and you don't have to get rid of them. Everyone else has to get rid of the triggers yes. for you. And this is the worst thing we could be teaching kids. Yeah. So, and that's great untruth number one in the coddling is what doesn't kill you makes you weaker yeah. uh, is the great untruth. Yeah. yeah, this idea of discover versus defend is, is interesting because it may resolve a contradiction that I hear a lot about from people who, who are not totally bought in on, the, on, on a stoic idea. Seneca has this idea of premeditatio malorum, or premeditation mm. of what could happen, yeah. right, of the evils. And so it seems contradictory to, to he's saying, on the one hand, don't be anxious, don't worry mm. all the time. But he's also saying, you gotta think about all the things that could happen so you're not caught by surprise. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it as you're trying to discover what could happen, what the possibilities mm -hmm. are, as opposed to, I gotta, you know, mm -hmm. crouch. I, I got to protect right. myself from all this horrible thing that's going to happen. Right. Maybe that. So, so when Seneca's going, "Hey, um, you know, you're you're about to head on this journey. What are the what are the possibilities here? What could right. go wrong? What could yeah, go right? That's right. How, what what would you do if this happened? What would you do if that happened? As opposed to, um, it's a very fraught and dangerous yeah, journey, and you won't right. make it out alive. And so, so it, it's seeing it with this openness, this almost this curiosity, mm -hmm. which you're intending yeah. to resolve or or satiate as opposed to this sort of reticence or withdrawal, this defensive right. crouch. That's right. Uh, and maybe that's how you resolve that idea of yeah. premeditation. Well, that's right. And, it, and because the premeditation does not cause anxiety. That is when, you know, and I tried to do, because uh, uh, Bill Irvine talks about this in the Stoic yes. Challenge, and I do this with my, with my students. You know, I try to imagine the, de the death of my children, as, yeah. as Aurelius does. Um, and it's, it's an awful thing, but it doesn't trigger cortisol and higher heart rate it's not it's actually sadness. anxiety yeah. it's it's a kind of a horror yeah. and, a, and a sadness um, but that but but I but I think the, their point is if you do this yes it's uncomfortable now right but it will reduce the pain later and that's what training is all about you know no pain no gain you have to have these experiences now when well, that horrible exercise the idea of as you tuck your child into night uh, yeah. imagining that they don't make it to the morning I think it's I, I don't it, the 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 gruesomeness of it is Marx Aurelius buries half of his children, and I don't I, I don't think there's any philosophical exercise that makes that not the worst thing that's ever happened to you, right? So I don't think he, I don't think he's doing it in a Buddhist detached way where he's mm. trying to say like I don't care about this person, this person's right. not mine. I think right. what he's doing is he's saying I'm going to imagine that this is the last time I tuck this yeah. person into bed, so I'm not going to rush through it. Yeah. I'm not going to take it for granted. So right. I, I think the way that it lessens the pain is not that it makes it less painful that they died. It's a regret minimization yeah. strategy in the yeah. interim, right? And and I think that's a really mm. important, like when you are thinking about the things that are happening, you're not just torturing yourself. You're like, I could get hit by a truck. I could get hit by a bus. I could mm. get hit by a missile. You know, you're, you're saying, well, what if the plane is late? What's my backup plan, right. right? You're thinking, so it's forcing you to be proactive and focus on what you're gonna do about it, mm -hmm. as right. opposed to just listing all the potential catastrophes and then catastrophes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. I don't know. It's a, it's tough though. I think an anxiety is a thing for me where uh, if I'm not taking care of myself, if mm -hmm. I don't have an exercise practice, I'm not eating well. If I'm mm -hmm. overworked, I'm just more susceptible to mm -hmm. it. You know. Yeah. So I think there's oh, a, yeah. there. It, it's it's about how good you are at regulating your life, so you're not as susceptible to yeah. this thing that that's we right. all do. No, that's right. We're, we are complex dynamical systems. Um, it, you know, it's a concept that I use in, in, in my flourishing class. You know, we're complex dynamical systems. We're not machines. Yeah. We, I mean, we sort of are machines, but it's better to think of us as something like the weather or the economy, yeah. where there's all these parameters. And if you change things over here, it might not come out over here. It actually could sort of like affect everything else somewhere else. Yeah. And so, yeah, and those are some of the parameters. And that's why it's so important to get, you know, get your sleep right, get nutrition. And actually, I'm basically just recapitulating like Andrew Huberman and yeah. Peter Atia and, and all these guys who really are helping us think about that. 
Uh, but yeah, um, you know, working on the, the, the foundation, there's so much you can do with your habits, but definitely, yeah, sleep, exercise, uh, diet, light. Um, I've, I've recently tried to incorporate more of that, like actually, you know, yeah. you know, looking not directly at the sun, but near it. Let's, no, let's... my doctor was like, when you go for your morning walk, do you wear sunglasses? And I was like, you know, if it's bright, I do. And he's like, stop doing yeah, that. Yeah, you know, right. he's like, you're, you're, you're mitigating the yeah. benefits of this yeah. thing that you're doing. And I was like, okay, that's like a yeah. little small thing. Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the huge problems with social media, like we, we tend to focus on what other people are doing and how that's bad for us. Mm -hmm. But I think the real insidious part is that box that pops up and it says, hey, what are you thinking about? Or like, oh, you know, okay. it's like, hey, react. what's your reaction to oh, this, yeah. right? So the Stokes say like, it's not things that are the problem, it's our opinion about them. Mm -hmm. And what right. social yeah. media really is, is fundamentally an opinion uh, solicitation machine. Yeah, it's right. saying, yeah. Hey, are you pissed off about something? Please exactly. share yes, it with as many right. people as possible, yeah. with as little nuance as possible, yeah. as quickly as possible. And that's, that's right. where you get in trouble. Yeah. Like you do things mm -hmm. that upon reflection, you're like, why did I say that? I don't believe that. Yeah. That wasn't a good idea. You know, that I didn't think about how that would affect that's other right. people. That's right. So that that brings to mind a, a quote from Marshall McLuhan that I recently came across again. You know, when, when television came in, it changed a lot of things. And there were all these great media theorists in the 20th century, Marshall McLuhan, Neil Postman especially, who wrote about how is this changing us? Yeah. And everybody was focusing on the content. Everybody yeah. was focused on, there was violence on TV. We have to have less violence and, you know, whatever. Like, let's change the content and then the kids will be okay. Yeah. And they were saying, no, no, you're missing the point. And McLuhan says, the content, something like the content is the juicy piece of meat that the burglar carries to distract the dog. Like, so everyone said, oh, we got to work. Yeah. And the same thing with social media. Everyone's going like, oh, you know, we have to get, you know, more content moderation. Yeah. And those Senate hearings, they're all about, can't you? No, but Senator, we spend $7 billion a year and we remove 2 billion pieces of bad content. Like, and what, what, what these media theorists said was, um, the content isn't that important. It's the medium itself. Yes. And as McLuhan famously said, the medium is the message. And so you just put it, I think, exactly right. You go from a television era in which, it, yes, it made us passive consumers. Yes, it made everything is now entertainment. Politics is entertainment. Everything's entertainment. And that is a change in society that was seen as being a change for the worse by people at the time. But it's much, much worse to then go from that to here. Here is a, here's an anger button. Yeah. And not just an anger button. Here's a dart gun. Yeah. So you can show your anger and you can dart anybody in yeah. the world. You can shame them. You can do it anonymously. You can create seven anonymous accounts. And so now we live in a world in which most of us don't want to dart anybody. Yeah. But people on the far left, the far right, and also trolls. There are men, just primarily men. Crazy who, people, yeah. That's right. Who just enjoy being jerks. Yeah. And so you get these three groups are constantly shooting the moderates especially. And this is having a transformative effect on our politics. The left and the right are going completely insane in this country, and I think it's going to drive us to ruin. But it's it's the insanity is, the insanity came especially, or at least was amplified, by social media when everyone has that anger button with a dart gun. Yeah, there's that expression of you talk uh, sense to a fool to call you foolish. I, I think that we've got to, what you realize in the social media era is when you're talking sense to a fool, you are a fool. Oh, or, yeah, you know, the yeah. person you're talking to, yeah. first off, might not even be real. Yeah, you are talking to true. a Russian bot yeah. or you're talking to uh, a troll who's taken on a persona mm -hmm. who's just trying to say yeah. something stupid to get yeah. you riled up. And so, yeah, it, what other people are doing on social media is actually not the problem. It's what it's doing to you, what yeah, you are right. doing, right? It's, it's that you feel the need two seconds after you read a news story or hear that somebody did something, you feel compelled to have an opinion about this. Yeah. And the Stoics uh, have this idea that Marx Lewis says, remember you always have the option to have no opinion. Mm -hmm. And that's harder to do when they're like, hey, if you say an opinion, I'll, I'll tell you how many people agree with that opinion. Yeah. I'll tell you how many people disagree with that opinion. Yeah. I'll tell you how many views your opinion got. Yeah. It, it tickles all these things that make us feel like we're a value or that we're yeah. not shouting into the void. And so, you know, the ability to just sit there with your own thoughts and to be pissed mm -hmm. off about something, like when you meditate and you have that feeling and then it just kind of drifts away, mm -hmm. the ability to, to do that is really important. And yeah. what social media is predicated on mm -hmm. is depriving you of the ability yeah, to right. do that. That's right. So tell me if, 
you know, if 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 Marcus Aurelius came back and was elected president, uh, or you know, dictator even, yes. well, he would. But he you might know, be if, more if comfortable. He, if it, you know, if he was, yeah. Um, you know, or if we could have a you know a stoic run country, sure. or stoic reforms, or a stoic Congress, what would it look like in this regard? Like, what changes? What would you do, or what would they do to get us out of this mess? We're all trapped in this. You what know, would you it, do? it is interesting, right? Because the Stoics are all trained in rhetoric and communication. Mm-hmm. I think that like what's yeah. so amazing about meditations is you have this guy's talking to himself yeah. more clearly than the greatest writers in history yeah. have ever done. So, I are they going to take advantage of these? Uh, communication platforms to get out messages uh-huh. that they need. I think yeah, absolutely. Yep. But are they also going to have a lot of personal self-discipline mm-hmm. about what they do and don't do on them? I think that's got to be part of it. And you see, that's what Marcus Aurelius is doing in meditations. Don't get bounced around by this. You don't yeah. have to respond to this. Mm-hmm. Let this person be an idiot if they want to be an idiot. You know, uh, don't 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 try to write this person off right. as an idiot right. just because they said something right. dumb. So I, I think I think they would they would use it, but then they'd also do what we're talking about here, which is like, what are the very clear boundaries that I have to have right. uh, with regards to this thing? And then I I would like you 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 described social media earlier as a collective action problem. Yeah. I think that's well thought. I think a lot of the problems we have in this today's world. Our collective action problems. And I think it's important that we don't see the Stoics, mm-hmm. although they have a lot of personal discipline and they try to focus on what mm-hmm. they control, they also were engaged in right. political life right. at every level. And yeah. so the idea that they didn't think things could be changed or mm. improved or regulated right. is to, it, it's not all this passive resignation of just like the world sucks and you have to put yeah. up with it. That, that's not why someone gets into yeah. leadership or politics. And so I don't know exactly what the solutions mm-hmm. are, but I would like to think they would be trying things. Yes, yes. And that's a good point, the contrast with the sort of the fatalism, because yeah. in many strands of Buddhism, not all, but in many strands, you get more the feeling of, in Taoism, like the yeah. wise person is not going to be in there trying to fix, they the withdraw. wise person will withdraw yeah. and will accept things as they are, and the universe is working itself out. And I think that's why Stoicism is is now so popular in the West, because, you know, there's always been an attraction, at least since the 60s, to Buddhism. Yeah. But it wasn't really a good fit with with the more action-oriented Westerners. Yeah. Um, whereas I think Stoicism, right, just as you say, I mean, you get a lot of the psychological benefits of being able to deal with the bad stuff. But the Stoics were very happy to have positive emotions yeah. and to have an effect on the world. So... Um, and look, that's the difference, the, the big tension between the Stoics and the Epicureans, where the Epicureans were like, tarry here in the garden, focus on your own flourishing, your own psychological well-being. It wasn't, Uh, oh, let's have orgies and feasts, but it was a withdrawal. And Uh, the Stoics were saying, that's well and good, but do you know what happens when you withdraw? You mm, cede the field to the not-so-good guys, right? And so there, there is something about Stoicism that's closer to that you know, Rooseveltian idea of like the man in the arena. Like you're trying, you're yeah. contributing, you're yeah. stepping up, you're 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 engaged. And so you're yeah, doing your I, civic I, duty. It's, yes, exactly. Yeah, it's right. It's it's much more characteristically Roman. Yes. You know, I can understand why Greeks would be Epicurean. Um, but yeah, I mean given what you know I what little I know about the Roman Empire, yeah. you know, it was an honor culture and a strong sense of civic duty. And man, I wish we had more of that today. Yeah, and you know, it's it's interesting. I, I've gotten to know a, a handful of elected leaders that are, are all sort of interested in the the, the personal self-development side mm-hmm. of Stoicism, but then mm-hmm. that sort of collective action, solving these big problems, thinking about how these decisions were, the decision not to address something because it's politically mm-hmm. unpopular or the base doesn't like it or the donors don't like it, that's a harder part, and that, I'm I'm talking about that now. I'm doing so. I'm doing this series on the cardinal virtue. So I'm on justice oh, good, now. Good. And but the idea that like, yeah, y- you have this obligation to try to heal the world, to make a positive difference, mm-hmm. to solve yeah. these problems. That that and then all yeah, collective action problems. If we all come together, they that's mm-hmm. also how you have collective action solutions. Exactly. And, exactly. And you can't just go. Things are awful because you. Then they just get more awful. That's right. Right. So let me tell let me tell you what I think yeah. the, the solutions are to Please. the collective action problems. So so in the anxious generation, you know, I spent a lot of time going through, you know, why is it that our kids are on this when they don't even like it? Why right. is it that we're letting them, you know, giving them phones in, in, in when they're ten and you know, letting them on social media when we don't want them? Um, and because it's these are collective action problems, 
The solution, as you say, is to act collectively. And so what I propose in the book is four norms, all of which we can do, all of which would be easy if we do them together. So the first is um, no smartphone till high school. Interesting. It's just... Do and not are give you a already phone. not supposed to legally be able to do it until you're 13? Well, that's social media. That's yes, next. Yes. So we're talking just talking about the hardware. Oh, wow. Okay. Just the phone. Now, people freak out like, well, how will I get in touch with my child? With a flip phone. Yeah. Just give them a flip phone. Okay. The millennials had flip sure. phones, and they were fine. Yeah. A flip phone is not putting the entire internet in your 10-year-old's pocket sure. to get addicted to porn <laughs> you know, on the school bus. Yes. Um, so no smartphone before high school. We have to get all of this stuff out of middle school. We've got to really protect middle school. Second norm, uh, no social media till 16. And that's the one where, yes, right now the law is you can't open an account till you're 13, but the law does not require the companies to check. Mm. So they don't. Right. They want to make sure that they don't know sure, so sure, that they sure. can't be held responsible. Um, but if we all just say, I'm not going to give, you cannot have an Instagram account until you're 16. Now, some kids, of course, are going to get around it. Yes. But the, the 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 collective action problem that we're stuck in is your kid says, but mom, I'm the only one. Right. Everyone sure. else is on it. Sure. Whereas if even half the kids are not on it, uh, then it's much easier. So that's norm number two. No social media till 16. Yeah, we don't say uh, you can let your kid drive whenever you feel like it. We've yeah. all agreed this is mm -hmm. about the time that they seem to be yeah. competent enough to make these decisions. And then because we all agreed on mm -hmm. that time, Everyone waits, and then it becomes kind of a, a rite norm. of passage. That, yes, a norm. exactly, yes. a rite of passage. That's yeah. right. That's right. There should be graded steps on the way to adulthood. Yeah. But once you give your kid a phone, that's it. Right. They, they have everything whenever they want. Yeah. You know, pornography, violence, everything. Sure. All at once. The third norm is phone-free schools. There is so much research now that if a kid has a phone in their pocket and it vibrates, they're gonna check it. Yeah. If some kids are texting during the day, all kids have to check their texts or right. they are left out. They don't know what the big thing is that someone said or did. And sure. some, so uh, this is just kryptonite for attention. Nationally, academic achievement is going down and people say, oh yeah, because of COVID. Right. No, no, right. it actually began in 2012. 2012 was the high point. It's been going down since then. Interesting. So phone-free schools. There's okay. no excuse for letting kids have phones in schools. And this is through from K through 12. And the fourth norm, this is a piece we haven't really talked about yet. The fourth norm is um, far more independence, free play, and responsibility in the real world. Because this is the other half of the story. In the, you know, in the anxious generation, a lot of it is about the, the great rewiring of childhood into the phone-based childhood. But what we lost is the play-based childhood. What right. we lost is a childhood in which you go out and you experience challenges and setbacks without supervision. If there's yeah. an adult around, they're gonna step in and help you. So kids have to have a lot more unsupervised time the way all kids did. You know, you're, I grew up during the crime wave. Anybody my, I'm 60, anybody who's, you know, 40 and older grew up during a huge crime wave. And there were drunk drivers, there were perverts, you know, walking around <laughs> molesting kids. I mean, not often, but like it's they the were- the time. <laughs> well, no, but my point is there were risks yeah. and we had to face the risks and that made us stronger. Right. Now those risks are minimal. Right. The crime is way down. Drunk driving is way down. The perverts are not out there. They're on Instagram. Right. They all move to Instagram. Yeah, yeah they're all so on we, the internet. But we say, you know, and the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, keep reporting on this. The perverts are on Instagram. Yeah. Um, it lets them get to get sure. to young girls, young boys. Um, so, you know, so the, the, the bottom line in, in the book is we have overprotected our kids in the real world and underprotected them online. So we have to do both. You yeah. can't just take the phones away sure. and say, then no, what are they supposed to do? Right. What are they yeah. going to do? That's right. Yeah. So you have to work with, and this is the key thing, uh, if there are any parents listening who have young children, communicate with the parents of your kids' friends, because I guarantee you they're concerned about this too, and say, you know, I'm planning on following these four norms. And, you know, when my book comes out March 26th, I'm going to try to be everywhere. I'm yeah. going to try to make sure everybody hears about these yeah. four norms. But you know, just create a text thread or just talk whenever you can with the parents of your kids' friends. Because if, if you get to three of the friends, and so you've got a group of four kids who are not going to have smartphones yeah. till high school, who are not going to have social media till 16, who are not going to have unlimited time on an iPad or unlimited video game time, but instead are going to have a lot of independence. So that by third grade, 
I think kids need to be out by eight. Yeah. By around age eight, third grade, they should have some independence. They can walk to a friend's house. They can go play in a park. Um, if they're doing things together, they're really happy. Right. But if they're doing things together with phones, they're going to sit down and be on the phones next to each other. Yeah, we found like when we are just like, oh, let's not do anything today. That's mm -hmm. where it's harder to say, no, you can't have the screen. No, yeah. we're not going to watch TV all day. Right. But when we're like, we're going here, then we're doing this, then mm -hmm. we're doing this, even if it's running errands, the, the, it's, it's, you're getting the stimulation from reality, from right. activity, right. not from you know, whatever you're scrolling yeah. on. That's your right. Phone. And that's what the brain is expecting. Yeah. There's a, a feature called experience expectant development that uh, neurologists talk about, brain scientists talk about which is evolution built us so that the brain is not, it's not designed by the genes. The genes have very little information in them. The genes just get the neurons started. And then it's kind of expected that there'll be certain kinds of input, you know, language at a certain point, and then they're going to start walking, get physical feedback. So there are developmental tasks at each age, and the brain is kind of expecting certain kinds of feedback. And the brain of a five, six, seven, eight-year-old is expecting a lot of climbing, running, chasing, yeah. playing, pretend, all this stuff. Yeah. And it's not, it's not built to just do swiping. Yeah. So as we wrap up, walk me through the, the three great untruths, because mm -hmm. I think almost each one of them feels like it is... The antithesis is rooted in Stoic wisdom. Yep, exactly. So I think, yes, I sent you that sheet that yeah. I give to my students. So I'll tell you the great truth, and yeah. then why don't you read a quote that okay. is the exact All antithesis right. of it. Okay. So, so great untruth, number one, um, is um, uh, um, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Yes. Meaning you should avoid unpleasant things because yes. they'll harm you, they'll traumatize you, they'll damage you like paper cuts. So avoid unpleasant things. What would the Stoics say? Well, in, in meditations, Marcus really says uh, the impediment to action advances yeah. action. What stands in the way becomes the way. And basically the whole exactly. idea is that everything is fuel for you to practice yeah. some virtue. So the idea, it, it's not that everything magically, you know, helps you make more money or be happier, but it, it's that, you know, frustrating people are a chance to practice patience. Yeah. You know, someone, mm -hmm. uh, someone hurting you is a chance to practice forgiveness. Uh, you know, a delay is a chance to practice this, you know, the mm -hmm. idea is that these things, if you see them as resistance training Exa for yes. developing the yes. countervailing virtue, then it's you're not going to you're, you're probably never going to get to the point where you're excited that bad stuff is happening. Right. But you you understand and you have confidence in your ability yes. to learn from and grow and do things because mm -hmm. of this thing you didn't want to yeah. happen happening. That's right. So the key idea there is what we call in psychology anti-fragility. Yes. A term made up by Nassim Taleb. Um, and that, right, we, we need that resistance training. We need to strain the muscles in order to strengthen the muscles. Um, and uh, let's see, was there anything else to say about about that? So that's the first, the first great untruth. Yes. Um, okay, second great untruth. Um, always trust your feelings. <laughs> What do you think? What would the Stoics say about that? Yeah, the Stoics are saying of all the things to trust, your feelings are at the absolute bottom of the list. You know, your feelings are constantly misleading you. They're saying, hey, every time you have an impression, every time you have a feeling, they're like, put it to the test. Yes, that's right. The Stoics say we have this, the, 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 the feeling of fantasia or fantasia, I forget the, the Greek word. But the idea is you have that initial reaction, but then you have the ability to go, is this yeah. true? Mm -hmm. Do I want this? Do I want to feel this way? And, and also, I think the, the distinction I make is having the feelings. If you feel it, it is true. Like you are angry. Well, I, I, it's true that you're feeling something. That's what but it I mean. doesn't mean. But, but yeah. I'm saying you feel if something has made you feel anger, that's there's a difference between then acting on said anger. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you know what I mean? So the, I think when people say trust their feelings, they don't just mean go like uh, what they mean is that your feeling and what it's telling you to do is the right thing. And that's but, but definitely not, it's not, not true. just what it's telling you to do. It's what it's telling you is real. So if someone has made you angry, the anger emotion causes you to perceive a justice violation. Yeah. They mistreated me. They did something they shouldn't do. And therefore, the implication is someone needs to punish them, possibly yes. me, or maybe yes. I report it. Yes. Um, so, uh, so f you know, feelings are important. But this is the whole point of CBT, and this is the close relationship between Stoicism and CBT. Is you know, Aaron Beck and the others in the '60s and '70s found that people will spontaneously look for evidence that their feeling is right. Yes. Will look for reasons to back up your anger at your wife or your teacher, whoever. Um, 
but we don't spontaneously look for evidence on the other side. Yeah. That's a discipline. That's a practice. Yes. And that's what CBT teaches you to do. Yeah. Epictetus's line is, remember when you're offended that you are complicit in taking offense. Yeah, that's right. And I, that's so right. I think realizing that, hey, yeah, what? because basically the core of Stoicism is things are. And then our opinion, like things are objective, mm-hmm. our opinions about them are subjective. So you go, That's right. they said something. It exists. It was a mm-hmm. combination of sounds yep. and whatever. But the idea that what they said is offensive or racist right. or cruel mm-hmm. or wrong, that requires you mm-hmm. to ascribe a judgment to that that's thing. Right. And that's not and to you say you could that, be wrong. Yes. You could be right, but you really could be wrong. Yeah, and, and that, yeah, that's not to say that everything is okay mm-hmm. and that yeah. we should just accept people. And, and yeah. it certainly doesn't mean that you should go around doing those things. That's right. That's right. But it says, hey, let's step back and let's, is there another way I could see this? Yeah, that's right. 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 And if we could, you know, if we could basically just, you know, cut our outrage reactions by 90%. Yeah then we'd only be five or 10 times as angry as we were 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? um, All right, what's so, the third great okay. entry? So the third is really the most damning. It's the one that causes the most problems yeah. worldwide. And that is, life is a battle between good people and evil people. What would the yeah. Stoics say about that? You know, I was, I was actually thinking about that one. This is, I, I wonder if people might think that actually the Stoics agree, because this is the passage, this is the opening of Meditations. Uh, book two. Book one is is gratitude. Right. But book two is Marcus Aurelius saying, when you awake in the morning, tell yourself the people I will deal yeah. with today will be meddling and ungrateful, arrogant, dishonest, jealous, and surly. And they are like this because they can't tell good from evil. But I have seen the beauty of good and the ugliness of evil. Okay. But he still isn't saying that they are evil. Well, what I was going to say. He's saying, say- you know, have some forbearance with these people. Agreed. But what I was going to say, so you think he's saying, hey, look, there's good people and bad mm-hmm. people. And, and I think there are good people and bad people. But he says, uh, but I recognize in the wrongdoer a nature related to my own, uh, not of the same blood or birth, but the same mind. And so they can't hurt me. And he says, no one can implicate me in ugliness, mm-hmm. nor can I feel angry at my relative or hurt him because we were born to work together like right. feet, hands and eyes, like two that. rows of teeth, yeah. upper and lower. Yeah. To feel anger at someone, to turn your back on him this is an obstruction. That's right. That's right. There's, in, in, in Aurelius and in, in the other Stoics, there's an awareness, as there is in great literature, that people are complicated. Yeah. Um, there's a line we, we quote in, in The Coddling of the American Mind from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who said, the line between good and evil runs through every human heart. Mm-hmm. And great literature shows you that, whereas cartoons and social media are the opposite. There are good people and bad people, and we all have to get together now to chime in, to condemn this. To So, um, yeah, so a world that is less moralistic, more humble, slower to judge, quicker to forgive, that's the kind of world that I think we all want to live in. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm writing about this in the Justice book now. Is like, Today, when people use the word like allies, like, are you an ally? Uh, what yeah. they're saying is like, do you think exactly what I think and agree with me 100 percent? When in fact, allies historically, politically in the history of war is about people with a variety of different views and interests mm-hmm. finding common ground on specific things mm-hmm. where they can work together right. and solve right. specific problems. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think uh, Churchill's line was something like, the only thing worse than fighting with allies is fighting without allies. Um, and, and mm-hmm. you know, yeah. but, that actually the great social movements, the great social change has come from allies who were not at all in lockstep, but found agreement mm-hmm. enough in a right. specific issue that, and, and then had the forbearance and the tolerance and the open-mindedness to say, you know, I don't care about all the things we disagree with. Mm-hmm. I care right. about the things that we agree with. Yeah. I, I'm a more uh, pragmatic approach. Yeah. Um, less moralistic. Yeah. Like a, a Harvey Milk. Uh, how does Harvey Milk come to power in San Francisco? He allies with the Teamsters. Oh, cool. Uh, and he helps them. Uh, the, the Teamsters are boycotting uh, bars in San Francisco. Uh, who or They're boycotting Coors uh, beer. Okay. In, and, and he says, I'll help you get it out of gay bars if you start hiring gay drivers. Oh, wow. And, okay. and yeah, then that, that relationship yeah. is what ultimately, that's his first sort of political constituency. Mm. And so uh, even, even in the women's rights movement, I talk a lot about this, it's like the, the, the women who got together and said women should deserve uh, to vote or, or mm-hmm. you know, are, 
constitutionally uh, able to vote. You know, they're saying there there was Mormon women who were po- uh, polygamous. There mm-hmm. was black women and white women, rich women and poor women, mm-hmm. and they had. If you ask them what the role of women in society was, they would have very different answers. Mm -hmm. But if you ask them, uh, should women be given access to the ballot, they Mm -hmm. were in agreement there. And and I think that's that's our problem so much now with good Mm -hmm. and evil is like someone's all good or all Mm -hmm. evil. Well, that's right. When politics is about horse trading, uh, strategic alliances to achieve outcomes. Yes. Then that's what politics is supposed to be for. Yes, and that's then how it works. it's effective. But what's happened? Because, as I say in the Righteous Mind, you know, we evolved for small-scale societies that are deeply religious that circle around sacred objects to make us stronger, especially in battle against other groups. That's the kind of minds that we have. We don't have to be tribal. We can calm that down, but it's very easy to ramp it up. And our politics, unfortunately, has morphed. In the you know in the TV age or and before you know it was more pragmatic stuff, but especially in the social media age, and this began in the TV age with cable TV, because it's much more moralistic. We get a culture war mentality, yeah. and now it's us versus them. It's yeah. red team versus blue team. Yeah, and you know the way our founding fathers set up American democracy, or I should say, a republic with democratic features, it can't function. No, if. We are two opposing tribes who cannot compromise. Yeah, because you're almost never going to get an absolute majority. You have to create right. uh, a majority by cobbling together several different yeah. minorities. And yeah. and yeah, if you have this uh, us or them, good versus evil mentality, you're you're probably not going to be able to do that because you're going right. to be too pure for it, too That's self-righteous it. That's for That's it. Right. That's right. That's right. So I think we're in agreement yes. that our society is in huge trouble. But if uh, the ideas of the ancients, especially the Stoics, were more widely understood, we would have a citizenry with the virtues that the founding fathers kind of hoped that we would have. Yes. How's that? I agree. I totally agree. This was awesome. Thanks for coming. All right. Ryan, my pleasure. You want to go check out some books? Yeah. Let's go look. Let's do it. Dawson, you ready? Yeah. We'll just go through some books in the bookstore. We get like another little video out of it. And okay, then- sure.